Hope you had a great summer. My name is Nicole Netherton, the Executive Director of Travis Audubon. So glad to have you tonight. If you are a member, we thank you so much for your continued support. If you are not yet a member of Travis Audubon, I hope you'll join us. You can go to the membership page on our website, which is travisaudubon.org. And we have a few quick announcements this evening. I wanted to show you, I'm sporting my fabulous Travis Audubon Cara Cara shirt. If you don't have one already, we will be having a reissue of those shirts before the holidays, so stay tuned for that. Um, we are having this meeting on Zoom, of course, but if you are ready to get back to monthly in-person meetings, I have some good news for you. We're gonna be holding our next speaker series, we won't have a speaker, monthly meeting at the Baker School, which is the home of our new staff offices in Hyde Park, and we will be having a social gathering and trivia night. So you can dust off your best bird trivia knowledge Mark your calendars for October 20th. We'll be sharing more details about that soon. We really hope to see you there. There are also still tickets available for our annual Victor Emanuel Conservation Award celebration. This time it's taking place in the evening on October 6th. We are back in person at the Austin Country Club. We are so excited about it. We are gonna be honoring Camp El Ranchito this year. And it's the first time that our award will go to a whole community, which is the campers, the staff, and the Ayers family who established the camp to share their historic Hill Country Ranch. So you can find out more information on our website, but you need to hurry if you're interested in joining us because tickets are only available until September 29th, which is coming right up. Um, another announcement, as you know, it is the peak of fall migration right now, and we're hoping that you're seeing lots of cool things flying through. I've been hearing lots of reports of yard orioles. If you want to share in the chat any birds you've been seeing, we'd love to hear about them. I'll remind you that one of the best ways that you can help migrating birds is to turn off your lights at night from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Really anytime year round, but especially now until migration concludes around Thanksgiving. We also have some really beautiful yard signs available. If you don't have one and would like one for your yard, you can uh, click on the information on our website and we can arrange curbside delivery for your beautiful lights out sign. And I'll just highlight one other event that we are rebooting now that COVID is getting better, which is our annual catio tour. You may know catio is a cat patio and it's one of the best ways that you can provide your hopefully indoor cat with um, some entertainment and pseudo outside time by building one of these. And there are lots of great folks all over town who've already built these and we do a tour. It'll be on November 12th. It's free, but it does require registration. So you can check out more information on our website. That is plenty of announcements and I know you're ready to get started. So I thank you in advance. If you would mute your microphone and turn off your camera. If you can enter your questions in the chat for the Q&A at the end, we will we'll wrap up uh, that way. And you can look for the recording of this meeting on our YouTube channel after we're done this evening. So it's now my pleasure to introduce my friend and Travis Audubon board member, John Bloomfield, who is here to introduce tonight's fantastic speaker. Hello, John. Hey, um, yeah, tonight I think we're all in for a real treat. Uh, Jonathan Meigberg, who uh, some of us may know from his days in Texas, uh, Jonathan's an acclaimed musician, scientist, and author, and he's going to take us inside the world of the group of birds that we know as Cara Caras, who um, uh, are just incredibly mischievous, intelligent, and probably Jonathan may or may not agree, but probably very understudied. Um, he's the author of the critically acclaimed book uh, from last year called A Most Remarkable Creature, The Hidden Life and Epic Journey of uh, the world's smartest birds of prey. And if you haven't read the book, um, I kind of describe it as a mashup of genetics and evolution, travel, history, and adventure. And it's all really, really entertaining. When Jonathan's not studying and writing about birds, music fans may be familiar with his uh, work with the bands uh, Ockerville River, uh, Shearwater, and Loma, who are all pretty critically acclaimed in their own light. So please, Join me in welcoming Jonathan. We're very happy to have him back in Texas and um, look forward to what he's got to say. We'll be back uh, for the Q&A afterward. Jonathan. Thank you, John. Uh, I, but before we get started, I should warn you that um, in order to get the best internet signal where I am, I've had to sit in the room with the dogs in it. Uh, so there may be an explosion of dogs uh, at, at any moment. Um, so 
uh, don't, uh, I'll try not to be act too alarmed, um, but uh, don't you get too scared either, but they are a bit on the loud side. Ghost, Bobo, you listening? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk a bit about the world of the Caracaros, um, this most remarkable and, uh, and fascinating group of birds of prey. And luckily you guys uh, are probably all familiar with them to at least some degree because there's one that lives here. Let me share my screen. All right, and here's one, and this is a this is a Texan one. This one's down in Hidalgo County, but this is the crested caracara that you may know from around town. Uh, they're just so funny when you look at them. It, it uh, a lot of people seem to think that there's only one species, and I, I can understand why because they just seem so unique when you see them here. They're they seem almost like they've been assembled from parts of other birds. It's like they have the wings of a turkey vulture and sort of a uh, some kind of eagle-ish legs and kind of a chickeny body, maybe, and maybe a face of a who knows what this thing is. It's like a it's like a harpy or a miniature secretary bird or something. Uh, and you see them uh, around here often hanging out with other scavenging birds, um, like this turkey vulture here. Uh, you know, at the at carcasses by the side of the road and this kind of thing. And we'll uh, we'll get into more about why you might be seeing them more frequently a bit later. But the bird that's on the cover of my book uh, is not a crested caracara. It's a striated caracara, which is one of the nine living species of caracaras. And it's also the rarest and the furthest away from here because it only lives on islands at the tip of South America of Tierra del Fuego and the, the Falkland Islands. And the, the image that I put on the cover of the book um, is a, the very first painting ever made of one by a European, so far as I know. This was made in 1775 by George Forster, who was the naturalist on board um, Captain Cook's second voyage in the Resolution. And he made it on the, on the island that's uh, sometimes called Staten Island or, or Isla de los Estados, which is down off of the tip of Tierra del Fuego. It's not, not the Staten Island that you're first thinking of. But what I love about this image is that you can really tell that he saw the bird because the bird isn't just uh, there, it's looking right at him. And if you visit them today in places like the Falklands, this is exactly how they are. They look into you uh, and they come right up to you. Uh, they hang out in groups. They're very social. They're very curious. They seem sort of more like raccoons or um, that one early shipwrecked sailor in the Falklands said that they were seemed like a combination of a vulture and a crow. Um, and uh, also said that uh, they were the most mischievous of the feathered creation. <laughs> And the funny thing about them is that we'll return to the striated caracaras here in a minute. These are young birds from their, their darker colored kind of coffee colored plumage and, and dark bills there. But uh, they're not crows or vultures. They're actually falcons. Uh, and this, of course, is a peregrine falcon, which we have around here and are sort of the most famous of all falcons uh, in the northern world. They, uh, and when we think of falcons, this is the kind of bird we tend to think of, these fast uh, single-minded hunters, mostly of other birds uh, that are not particularly social and they're just real experts at what they're doing. They're so no nonsense um, and very beautiful, um, but very, um, uh, they're, they're specialists, you know, they're, they're, they're paid really well. And caracaras, on the other hand, are a, a very different model. Uh, now, this isn't a caracara though. What, uh, what I meant to say was that, um, even though we have more species of falcons in the northern world um, than there are in South America, there's a greater diversity of falcons in South America because this is where they seem to have come from. Uh, and the there are some really unusual falcons in South America that you don't think of and you'll never see in a falconry show like this one, which is a laughing falcon, which is a little snake eating specialist from tropical South America. Cute little thing. Uh, and uh, this is one of the mysterious forest falcons, which live in the tropical forest, and they're kind of like accipiter hawks a little bit, but really almost nothing is known about them uh, to the degree that this one, which is a cryptic forest falcon, was first described in 2015 uh, from the Atlantic coast forests in Brazil. But the caracaras are kind of the most conspicuous and, uh, and unusual falcons in South America, and their, their crowiness is sort of... Um, uh, well, especially interesting in light of the fact that there are not crows in South America. Uh, there are some jays in the tropics, but there aren't any big black crows. There aren't ravens. There aren't American crows, fish crows, the kinds of things that we're used to seeing. 
around here. And this didn't escape the notice of Charles Darwin. Now, this is actually the only uh, contemporary illustration of life aboard the Beagle that we know of. And uh, you can see Darwin is actually in the middle of the image here. He's the, the character in the top hat and he's examining some specimen. He's got things down at his, uh, uh, his feet there. Somebody's written Tusk 2003 BC fossils. And you can see people are bringing things to him, including uh, uh, rather improbably some boulders and a, a giant palm tree. And uh, this guy, who's my favorite, who says, the least I can get for these is a tot. He's got his hat full of seashells. And by which he means a tot of rum, because Darwin would pay people to bring him stuff. Uh, it's a good way of uh, uh, increasing your surveying effort when you're essentially just a, a, a sort of fancy rich lad on a, on a jaunt, uh, which he was. Uh, he was 22 years old uh, when the Beagle sailed. Uh, but he was really taken with the Caracaras, uh, which he said, well, uh, uh, supply the place of our carrion crows, magpies, and ravens, a tribe of birds found throughout the world, but absent in South America. Um, but he also called them um, uh, disgusting. Uh, said that they ill become so high a rank as birds of prey. They didn't really act right. Um, and over here, you can see there's a guy who's bringing him a, a, he's saying, I've killed a fine specimen of flying monkey, shot three specimens of geese, and was very near being yaffled by a damn big bear. And sure enough, right down uh, on his hand, he's got a flying monkey that the ship's dog or maybe cat seems to be interested in. And uh, this drawing was made just before Darwin visited the Falklands. And what's uh, curious is that Darwin then met an animal that was known to whalers and sealers as flying monkeys. Now, just to remind you where this is, um, here's South America on a, um, I guess after kind of a rough night, because it's kind of tilted over, but there's, you can see the Falklands down here uh, and surprisingly close really to the Antarctic Peninsula, which is really compressed on this map, but still that's a distance of about, you know, less than 800 miles. Um, they're really, really far down. They're about the size of Connecticut or, or, uh, or Wales. And uh, striated caracaras live now pretty much only on the, uh, in the Falklands, only on the outermost islands, like the Jason Islands that they've got the little box of up there. Here are two of the Jason Islands, Steeple Jason and Grand Jason. And uh, Steeple Jason is a place that figures a lot in the book. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, these are Gentoo penguins coming ashore here. Uh, the shadow in the foreground is me. Uh, this is how close you can get to them. Uh, as long as you stay still, they really kind of act like you're not there. And uh, this young striated caracara is winging in over this group of penguins to see if they might cough up some bits of digested fish for it, or, or maybe if one of them, if it was lucky, has been gravely wounded by a sea lion. You can actually see other striated caracaras in this picture, sort of in the background. And there's also a giant flightless duck down there. This is an adult striated caracara wearing uh, its sort of dress plumage that they get after about five years uh, of, uh, you can see it's got nice yellow legs and a clear kind of silver gray bill, orange facial skin, and uh, those chestnut kind of trousers. It's also got big chestnut patches under the wing and these streakings, which is where the, uh, the term striated comes from down its, uh, it's sort of done its front and then across its shoulders and hackles. And, they, uh, Steeple Jason is absolutely crowded with seabirds. It's got albatrosses, penguins, petrels, hundreds of thousands of birds. Even though the island's not very big, you could walk around it in a day. And so in the summer months, striated caracaras have a lot to choose from as far as what they want to eat. And there are a lot of striated caracaras on this island, uh, at least 70 or 80 breeding pairs usually in the summertime. Uh, but in the winter, they face a strange dilemma because uh, the seabirds all leave. They all go to sea. They can drink salt water, they can forage in the ocean, they don't need land for anything. But the caracaras can't swim and they can't follow them. So part of the research that I did with striated caracaras over the years was trying to figure out what they did in the wintertime. Did they go somewhere else? Did they just hang around? And what we found, uh, visited the, the Steeple Jason and other islands in the wintertime, was that they did stick around. Uh, there were more than 300 birds, uh, 300 striated caracaras on this island in the middle of the winter. And this one is standing in the middle of a black browed albatross colony that's bereft of albatrosses. These are um, albatross nests about the size of a, of a spare tire that is standing on, looking sort of forlornly out to sea. And what we found them doing a lot was this, uh, digging in the ground for uh, grubs and earthworms, spiders, beetles, other invertebrates, which other caracaras also do a lot in uh, mainland South America. And they, they do this to such an extent that you can actually see, if you know what you're looking for, patches in the satellite photos where striated caracaras have dug up the turf 
on islands in the Falklands. And if I, I put you there, you would, and just showed you these areas, you'd, are there pigs here? Um, or a rototiller gone amok? You'd never think that it was falcons that were doing this. These younger birds mostly, uh, this is another picture I took with my phone, are assembled next to uh, the carcass of a sea lion that was, you know, some weeks old and not in good shape at all, but they didn't seem to care. They were just uh, cramming their faces with it. And the one in the middle there, you can see he's got this sort of bulge in the middle of his chest. Um, he's fine. Um, they have the props that can really distend and, and uh, to, a, to a pretty great degree when they're just like cramming food in, as many vultures do. And uh, in the adults, these are orange. It's like it's like a flag saying, hey, I'm eating. Uh, and I think this helps a little bit with their uh, sociality in the sense that uh, a bird that's really gotten into something good can't really hide it from the others. So if there's a, there's a lot of food to be had, everybody's going to find out about it pretty quickly. Now, as you might imagine, birds that act like they uh, have run into trouble with people. And uh, in, the, in the Falklands, there was actually a bounty placed on them by sheep farmers back in the early 20th century, and they were shot out of most of the islands. Uh, their numbers are now estimated to be about 2,500 to 3,000 pairs, which puts them somewhere, uh, or sorry, adult individuals, not pairs, which puts them around in the same uh, uh, realm as like giant pandas in terms of numbers. Uh, but as a, a, one naturalist remarked in the 20s after they were again protected, uh, they had not learned that man is dangerous. And so if you visit them, they would come to visit you. And you have this feeling that it, it's sort of like a door is opened into the time or something. It's you, you remember that animals uh, did not always run away from us. That wasn't always their first reaction. They had to learn to do that. And if you visit striated caracaras, they um, have not yet uh, learned this lesson. This is Lorraine McGill, a Falkland Islander uh, who lives on an island called Carcass Island which despite them is actually quite a beautiful place. And these birds are assembled uh, behind her in her back garden there because that's the door to her kitchen and she'll feed them kitchen scraps sometimes. Is there, uh, there's one next to my, uh, my backpack. And uh, this is me taking a dinner order in uh, New Island in the Falklands. Actually, there's a, uh, there's a trap underneath this scrum of birds uh, where we're catching them to, to band them. Uh, but it's they're the easiest birds to trap that you'll ever find. Uh, you can just stand there and they'll they'll come and get in the trap and you can get them out, ban them, let them go. And then let, as often as not, they'll come and get back in the trap again to get some more food. Now, uh, this is a, a man named Len Hill, who I talk about in a chapter in the book called the, the In the Court of the Penguin. Oh, wow. It's okay, guys. Uh, Len Hill uh, in... He has a long story, which I won't tell you right now, but suffice to say that he bought Grand and Steeple Jason in the 1970s and imported all kinds of birds from there to a weird little bird park he basically established in his backyard in England called Birdland. And uh, here are some of its uh, residents, but among them, uh, as far as we can tell, were the uh, uh, ancestors of all the captive striated caracaras that now exist, which may have been only about six or seven birds. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a surprising number of captive striated caracaras, especially in the UK, but all over the world. They're, they number, um, as, there may be as many as 150 or 200 of them now. And in captivity, uh, as you might sort of expect, they do the most incredible things. This bird uh, was named Tina, pictured with her keeper, Jeff Pearson, at a, a falconry park in um, uh, Devon, was, was able to do <laughs> things in flying demonstrations that you could never get another bird of prey to do, and she totally stunned Jeff, who was used to the northern falcons and, and eagles and hawks and uh, other birds, of, more familiar birds of prey for us. Uh, Tina could recognize stuffed animals by name, um, objects by shape and by color, uh, and she really kind of trained Jeff almost more than anything. Uh, she would uh, she would hang out with him and play with him even if she wasn't hungry. Um, she called for him insistently if he wasn't around when he was supposed to be. Uh, they were friends, and they stayed that way uh, for for at least two decades um, until she uh, she died uh, in the in the mid two thousands. And this is her successor, Evita, who's playing with a, a stuffed toy of one of her ancestors. Now, this is not a caracara. This is a kia, a mountain parrot of New Zealand uh, that has some interesting similarities with with striated caracaras in particular, but with all caracaras in general. And the reason I have it here is because. Um, genetic research revealed in uh, about 2008 for the first time that uh, 
falcon's nearest relatives are not other birds of prey. They are not hawks and eagles. Their nearest relatives are actually parrots. So parrots and falcons have a common ancestor that I suspect probably lived in Antarctica. And uh, you can kind of see in the behavior of, uh, of this species and caracaras, uh, you feel like you can get a glimpse of what the sort of ancestral, the mind of their ancestor might have been like, uh, which I, mean, I can't prove this, but my suspicion is that the falcons that we know in the North, uh, it's not so much that caracaras became especially clever, it's more that the the northern falcons, the so-called true falcons, uh, kind of gave up this kind of mind, this inquisitive, problem-solving, curious social mind as they became uh, the, the peerless hunters that we know them to be. Now, uh, this is William Henry Hudson, who's kind of the hero of the the human hero of my book. I don't have time to explain all about him, but he was born in Argentina in the 1840s and uh, moved to England. Uh, in his 30s and stayed there for the rest of his life. And he became, uh, he was one of the founders of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and wrote novels, um, wrote uh, natural history, wrote memoirs. It's just a fascinating writer who was admired by people like Conrad and Wolf, um, but largely forgotten now. And he, uh, unlike most Europeans, loved caracaras. He called uh, the crested caracaras uh, that he grew up with south of Buenos Aires, um, he called them lords of the feathered race. Uh, and he especially, uh, well, this is actually interesting. This is a little, uh, this is a nest of crested caracaras with three fledglings that are about to, like, about to get out, it looks like. Uh, caracaras are unusual in that unlike the true falcons, uh, they still build nests. And some of which are really, uh, can become huge. There's actually a saying in Argentina that if you wake up and your hair is a mess, that you have a, have a caracara nest on your head. But he also loved this bird, which is called a chimango, um, chimango caracara. They are so common in Southern South America that you hardly notice them, or people do. And, and even the word chimango in Argentina can be used uh, to denote anything that's sort of like common, annoying, and, and worthless. There's a saying, no gastes pulvora in chimango, which means like, don't waste your ammunition on a chimango. <laughs> but they have the distinction of being the only caracara species introduced uh, to another place, uh, which is Easter Island, believe it or not, where they're now one of four land birds. You can find pictures of them perched on the giant stone heads. Uh, but despite their sort of modest, uh, sandy brown, dusty appearance, uh, chimangos are really interesting birds. And Hudson uh, was the first uh, European writer, at least ever to say so. He said um, that a bird so cosmopolitan in its habits would have a whole volume to itself in England, but being only a poor foreigner, it has had no more than a few unfriendly paragraphs bestowed upon it. Now, interestingly, there were some experiments performed, oh, I think in 2015, um, by an Argentine researcher named Laura Biondi and her colleagues, where they took a group of chimango caracaras out from the wild, and they uh, separated them into three groups, a control, uh, a demonstrator bird, a group of demonstrators, and a group of observers. The demonstrators were given boxes, plexiglass boxes, that they had to figure out how to open that had uh, a food item inside. Now, a lot of them figured out how to do this, but the observer birds watched them do this. They kind of called to each other while this was all going on. Uh, and when the observer birds were given a chance to open the boxes, their success rate was even higher. It was something like 84% of the birds figured out how to open the boxes, some of them uh, figuring out new ways to do it. And they seem to have this really um, pronounced ability to learn from others, to learn from their peers, um, to learn even from other animals, other species. Um, Hudson talks about watching them catching uh, catching winged termites along with flycatchers or standing in shallow uh, wetlands with uh, herons and other wading birds catching little fish. Uh, it's It really seems to be their superpower is the ability to learn and to, to pass on that knowledge culturally. Now, Amerindian people in uh, South America have often had very different attitudes towards caracaras than Europeans. Um, this uh, is in uh, is in Ecuador, in a town whose name now escapes me in the Andes. Um, these people are dressed as curiquingues, um, which are highly stylized birds uh, that were uh, sacred to the Inca and also to people before them. Um, and curiquingue, uh, curiquingues in uh, uh, solstice parades and and other holiday sort of events. Uh, dance and they sort of bow and and uh, scrape the ground and perform foraging motions of various caracaras uh, and they bestow good luck on everybody. And 
This is a curikinge also. This is a carunculated caracara. This is way up, um, you know, on the equator, but high up, you know, 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 feet in the Andes. And these birds are just so striking. There's nothing else like them. They, um, they're, you know, bigger than a raven. Um, there's a legend that if, if you mate them with a, with a chicken, you produce a, just an absolutely unbeatable fighting rooster. And uh, they're, uh, there's a they have an aura of good luck of good fortune um, and benevolence they're often associated with um, the appearance or they're associated with uh, uh, weddings there was even a legend at one point that if a, an, an unmarried woman who died uh, was uh, sometimes buried with um, uh, with a caracara because it was said that she was the, uh, the bride of a of a caracara further south um, this is on the altiplano the huge plateau um, at the junction of Chile, uh, Peru, and, and Bolivia. Um, that the, it's the part of the Andes that looks like a snake that swallowed an egg. And it's the largest and highest plateau outside of Tibet. And these are vicuñas in the, in the foreground here, which are uh, the wild ancestors of uh, alpacas. But this is the kind of landscape where you find uh, another closely related caracara, the mountain caracara. And this one is actually standing on the ruins of Machu Picchu. The, uh, the Inca emperors, War only only the emperor was permitted to wear the feathers of mountain caracaras in the mascapaicha or the the, the uh, headband that that he wore that signified his rank. The today or I guess this was a year ago now uh, in La Paz during the lockdown, um, this mountain caracara came started coming to an apartment block in the middle of town, and the people in this uh, one flat started feeding it. And it liked this situation so well that it brought two more uh, two more birds back with it, and they built a nest and made it and started uh, started breeding there as a trio. Further south, uh, this is Julia Clark. I, I put this in here because some of you may know her, um, or, or Hector Garza there in the background, one of her students. Um, I went with Julia down to far southern Chile, um, to the southern Andes, which are much lower, um, but still a uh, very, very desolate looking up in the, in the high elevations. This is only about 5,000 feet. Uh, Julia studies uh, ancient birds, um, birds from around the time of the Cretaceous extinctions and even, even earlier. Um, but in this kind of landscape, you find uh, this bird, which is a close relative of those last two I showed you. So they're sort of distributed down the Andes. This is a white-throated caracara, which is probably shouldn't be regarded as a separate species from mountain caracaras, but I think, uh, Scientists have been a little loath to, to give it up because it was first described by Darwin. But you can see it's hanging out here with, a, with our good friend, the black vulture. It's the same species that we see here. Now, outside of the Andes, um, there are caracaras in all other parts of South America, including the tropics. And in one section of the book, I spend a long time uh, ascending a remote river in Southern Guyana into one of the wildest parts of all South America to, to visit um, some of these tropical caracaras. Now, we ascended a river called the Rewa River, which you can see sort of blown up here. And we went as far up it as we could trying to find these birds. And I, I went in the company of some really extraordinary people. There's a red-throated caracara right there. I'll have more pictures of them in a minute. But you can still, you can see that kind of caracara. He's in the same pose, really, as like the bird on the cover of the book, that sort of dubious but interested kind of look. Uh, the, the people I was with um, were three uh uh, Amerindian men from the who live in the region. This is Josie George, uh, Rambo Roberts here with a young black caiman, uh, and Brian Duncan, uh, who were just extraordinary uh, company and uh, and unbelievably knowledgeable and and thoughtful and, and funny uh, people to travel with for six weeks. And the river is absolutely packed full uh, of fish. Um, you could drop a line in the water and and have one on the other end of it almost instantly. And it seemed like an almost magical kind of river until you remembered that this is not a magical river. This is a normal river. This is what rivers used to be like. And this right here is a, a, a wolf fish or an aymara, which can look like a coelacanth. And, you, and all along the river, you found um, there, were, there was evidence of, of people having lived there for quite a long time. These are marks uh, made by people who are sharpening stone tools, age unknown. And this is the fourth uh, person in our group. This is Sean McCann, who is, I should have given you a trigger warning. That is in fact, the largest spider in the world, a Goliath bird eating tarantula, which lives in that area. And Sean loves spiders. So he was delighted to have this one on his head. Um, I describe how this all happened in the book. So I won't really give too much away about, about that. But Sean uh, 
despite being just an unbelievably intrepid and curious and delightful person, um, is the only person to have studied red-throated caracaras in any detail in the last several decades. And uh, he studied them in French Guiana, which is not far away from there. And I love this picture of this bird because they've just got to be the weirdest falcons on earth. I mean, this bird is clearly a, a Muppet with those, those red eyes and the red skin on the throat and the yellow bill. And uh, they have a really weird uh, social structure and diet. Um, they live in groups of multiple males and multiple females, like a troop of monkeys almost. And they patrol a territory in the forest and they spend all day flying around and screaming in these sort of ritualized kind of um, war dances against anything they think might be a threat. And they, they sort of perform these funny little dance moves with their heads and, and, and buck forwards and they stare at their, their uh, they kind of bulge their eyes out at you a little bit. And you feel very mocked if you run into a group of these birds. But their diet consists almost entirely of wasps' nests, which is a pretty prickly thing to want to eat. And Sean's research uh, concerned the the suggestion that had been made that they must secrete some kind of wasp repellent because you know most of us wouldn't just go up to a wasp nest and start banging on it. Uh, but that's what they do. And I won't tell you um, whether he figured. I mean, he did figure that out. He he found the answer to that question. The answer was absolutely fascinating and not at all what he expected. But I will tell you one thing that he did find um, that he hasn't had the chance to follow up on. This is the first picture ever taken from inside the nest of a red, of red-throated caracaras. Um, all the nests were found by Sean, and he found that they were nesting inside giant bromeliads, you know, like those plants you buy at the grocery store, uh, that are way up in these tall trees. This one was almost 200 feet up in a tree. And this is a very startled young red-throated caracara looking at a human being for the first time. You can see there in the nest with it, there's bits of wasp comb that the adults have brought in because it's all its mommies and daddies keep bringing it food about every 15 minutes. But also there's this millipede down there. And Sean put a camera on this nest and he saw the adults bringing millipedes to it relatively often. And interestingly, they would sort of, they would hold the millipede up to the chick and kind of bite it and then drop it into the bottom of the nest. Um, and the millipede was, was dead, so it would just stay there. But the chicks wouldn't eat them, and he wondered why they were doing this. And one thought that he had was that they may actually be using them as a kind of pest control. Uh, there are primates that that rub millipedes on themselves uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear, but it's thought that um, millipedes, I mean, part of the reason they've survived for so long, there are millipedes almost in the fossil record, almost 400 million years old, uh, is that they taste really bad. They have these things called repugnatory glands that if you mess with them, with, as any of you who've picked up a millipede will find out, um, some of them are really poisonous, some of them are just irritating. Uh, but it may be that they actually can give a kind of a repellent property against ticks and mosquitoes and bot flies and all the things that want to live in you if you live in the, in the tropical forest. So if that's the case, they may actually be sort of uh, practicing a kind of, um, uh, using a kind of chemical technology, which would, you know, really be something for a bird of prey. Here's another one of the tropical caracaras. This is a young yellow-headed caracara, which they don't get the yellow head until they're uh, a bit older. Um, but it's doing a thing that they haven't seen doing a lot, which is, uh, it's not, this tapir, which it's, uh, it's standing on here, uh, is not dead, it's fine. Uh, it's, uh, it's grooming it, basically. It's looking inside its elevator, it's lifting up its ear to look in there. But they'll, uh, tapirs, when they see yellow-headed caracaras and also black caracaras, which you'll see in a second, uh, they'll actually roll over on their bellies like dogs and go like, can you guys, can you, you mind picking some of these things off? This is bugging me. And uh, their name, uh, the colloquial name in Brazil is Garapateru, which is like tick eater. And they're, if you look on the internet, you can see tons of pictures of yellow-headed caracara standing on cows, um, standing on capybaras, standing on any animal of any size. And there's even a record of them foraging in the fur of a sloth. Um, that's hanging there with a couple of yellow-headed caracaras clinging to its back and, and, uh, and clinging to its belly and, and eating ticks off of it. So this is a way they've found to survive that, you know, predates the arrival of North American fauna into South America. You know, they would have probably done this on giant ground sloths and maybe glyptodonts and giant rodents, you know, millions of years ago. And this is the, uh, the other tropical caracara. This is a black caracara, which looks to me like the kind of bird that the Adams family would keep as a pet with the little widow's peak and the sort of generally gothic expression. Um, they hang along, they hang around uh, riverbanks. They eat anything dead um, or alive that they can catch or find. 
And uh, we, we saw one just engaged in this wonderful interaction with a black vulture where uh, Josie had set a pile of fish guts um, on the on the river bank there. And um, this caracara just wanted it. At first it went up and got a little bit and then this vulture came in like a T-Rex and stomped in and chased it off. And the caracara then kind of came back and was just staring at this vulture for a long time. And then it suddenly charged at it and grabbed a fistful of fish guts in one foot and then it hopped away on the other one like this. <laughs> which was just a, a, a wonderful Cara Cara moment that was, you know, kind of clownish, um, sort of uh, just goofy and, and really effective. And that's, um, that's how they are. It's how they uh, navigate the world. This um, is a Cara Cara that is extinct. Uh, and it has the distinction of being the only bird of prey, as far as we know, to have been uh, rendered extinct by human beings in historical time. This is the type specimen of a Guadalupe Caracara. Uh, the island of Guadalupe is not the one in the Caribbean. There's another one off of Baja, California. And uh, they had a population of these uh, crested related Caracaras. But you can see they're a little different. They've got that herringbone pattern all the way down their body. And uh, they were uh, uh, wiped out finally on, uh, on December 1st, 1900, when the bird collector Rollo Beck turned up on Guadalupe and <laughs> shot nine of them. Uh, and he said two of them did away. Just a moment, the dogs are going to go crazy. I'm going to let them go. And they were never seen again. Uh, so it's a uh, I can tell you more about this bird if you like, uh, but it, it's sort of a long and fascinating story. But they, uh, a couple of them ended up uh, in San Diego, sort of displayed along the waterfront in a bar for a while. And one of them got loose and was um, uh, killed trying to, to get into a chicken coop down by the wharf. But this is a uh, crested caracara, obviously. Um, but this bird is a wild bird that's in Skykomish, Washington, a couple of years ago, which is about 30 miles uh, east of Seattle. And it's part of a group of, uh, or it's, it's part of what seems almost like a wave of crested caracara sightings. That they've, they've been seen fairly routinely now as far north as um, um, Alberta, um, Banff National Park, they've been in Nova Scotia. Um, they're, they're moving, they seem to be moving north uh, through North America. And they used to be here, uh, or they used to be sort of throughout the North American continent. There are crested caracaras in the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, for example. Um, but uh, they seem to have gone away during the time of the Pleistocene extinctions uh, when, you know, the big, the great big animals like mammoths and um, uh, mastodons and, and giant ground sloths and all the things that you see in the, uh, in the tar pits uh, were uh, disappeared at about the same time humans turned up, probably not coincidentally. Um, but they seem to be making their way back into the continent again, and partly, I think, in the company um, of old friends. Um, this uh, black vulture grooming this crested caracara here on that same stick in Hidalgo County uh, is not an isolated occurrence. You can see a lot of different pictures of this kind of behavior. Uh, I think as, um, I mean, as, as humans have transformed the landscape of North America over the last uh, couple hundred years, and especially in the last century, um, they've introduced a predator that rivals any saber-toothed tiger or anything that ever prowled the, the, the plains of, of uh, the West. Uh, in the Pleistocene, and that's cars. Uh, in 2016 alone, uh, cars in North America were uh, were estimated to, uh, I mean, I should say North America, north of the, of the Mexican border, because um, Mexico is part of North America. Uh, but they're estimated to, to have killed as many deer as the wildebeest population of the Serengeti. And that doesn't include uh, porcupines and coyotes and foxes and dogs and cats and raccoons and everything else that cars uh, kill every night routinely in exactly the same places. And so I think these uh, these scavenging birds have uh, gotten wise to this and are starting to realize that this is a good way that they can uh, they can coexist with us by just cleaning up the garbage by the side of the road, like you can see out here uh, near Dripping Springs any day of the week. There's a group of them down there in, in Delgo County with uh, black vultures and turkey vultures in the background. And this uh, is my last slide. This is uh, the island of Diego Ramirez. This is the southernmost point 
uh, of the South American continent. Uh, south even of Cape Horn, these are just rocks sticking up out of the water, but they're covered in albatrosses and penguins, and they also have striated caracaras living on them. Darwin heard that they were there back in the 1830s. They're still there today, and uh, they are the closest, I think, that any of the falcons have come to uh, reoccupying their ancestral homeland of Antarctica. And with that, I'm going to take questions. Here's my favorite piece of press I ever appeared in. Hi, John. All right. Hey. Uh, <clears throat> so um, if you haven't um, submitted questions, please pop them into the chat whenever you want to. But we'll start um, uh, with this one. Um, uh, one of our guests would like to know how you got interested in Kara Karas. Um, in 1997, I, I had this weird traveling fellowship after my after college. I had an English degree, and uh, I got this fellowship called the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship, which basically allows you to pursue a project that you design yourself in one or more countries you've never been to for a year. And so I'd never left the southeastern United States, and my poor parents had to take me to the airport and put me on a plane to Tierra del Fuego and bravely wave goodbye. <laughs> and uh, one of the what I wanted to study was remote communities, um, people who were really isolated in different parts of the world. And one of the places I went was the Falklands because I thought, well, that's an interesting human community. Uh, this this strange little outpost of of Britain um, is way down off the coast of South America. I mean, there are red phone boxes in the corner. People drive on the left on the one road. It's, um, it's really something. And uh, I wasn't especially interested in birds at the time. But I heard that you could see penguins on their breeding grounds there. And I thought, well, who doesn't want to see that? And so I went to go visit one of these. And a group of striated caracaras just turned up and just marched up and looked at me. And I thought, this is not normal, is it? <laughs> I had never heard of this animal. I had no idea what they were. I had never seen a wild animal that acted like this. And uh, I was just kind of hooked from that moment, really. And then I was lucky enough to be able to, to assist on a study of uh, the the first ever census of breeding pairs of striated caracaras in the outer islands of the Falklands for a couple of months. And uh, that really, you know, that really turned my head and, and didn't just introduce me to striated caracaras, it introduced me to the whole world of, of birds in general. That's great. Um, next question, a little bit of a technical question. Are caracaras actually falcons or falconids, or does it even matter? Uh, they're in the family falconidae, so I guess you could say they're falconids. Um, the, the true falcon designation really kind of bothers me because I, I, when you look at the genus falco in, in an evolutionary sense, it really looks like an aberration um, that has just proliferated with the spread of, of um uh, C4 grasslands during the during the late Miocene. Um, so it's it, I, I kind of think that maybe the caracaras are the true falcons. Um, but uh, but yeah, you could say that they're falconed birds. Yes. Great. Um, what town in Ecuador uh, was featured in your presentation just now? That's that, that is for, for it's, it's annoying the daylights out of me because it, I listed in the book and I remember it. But for some reason, it's not in my head this evening. Um, it's because it's not Riobamba that's in that's in Peru. Um, I can't remember. It's one of the highland towns um, near uh, Cotopaxi, okay. but I'm not certain. A uh, little bit of a travel question. Um, where can you stay if you visit the, Fal uh, the, <laughs> the Falcon <laughs> Islands? Well, um, there... <laughs> That's a very good question. I mean, some of the, if you go, the first place you would go to is Stanley, which is actually not close to the airport. The airport's a military base in the middle of East Falkland. And it's pretty easy to be stuck in Stanley and never see any of the, the wildlife that really makes the island so extraordinary, um, if that's what you're interested in. Um, but some of the outer islands like Carcass Island, um, Weddell Island, uh, New Island to some degree, um, Pebble Island, uh, Saunders Island, the are all, they're all, these are all privately owned, and um, you can go and, and visit these islands, and there are cottages you can stay in there, but you have to book you know, uh, well in advance. And you take a Falkland Island Government Air Service airplane, this little twin otter thing from the, from the airport, municipal airport in Stanley, 
And uh, every night on the radio, on the Falkland Islands radio service, they read out the list of who the passengers are on the planes and where they are going. <laughs> Fascinating. So Airbnb uh, won't do as much good there, right? Well, I don't know. You know, they, yeah. they're, they, they, uh, uh, Facebook, Facebook is, is absolutely uh, the, crucial in the Falklands now. Um, and uh, Airbnb might have listings there now. Uh, okay. Certainly, it's a, it's a fascinating place to visit. And if you can get out and around a little bit, you can see things that you simply cannot see anywhere else in the world. But the only check. way to get there is through Chile or um, if that's reopened, which I'm not sure that it has. And it was closed down during the pandemic or from there's one flight a week from Britain. Stopped okay. in Ascension Island, I think, 18 hours. Mm. What can you tell us about your next book project? Uh, it's a book about Antarctica. It's called um, The Secret Land, The Once and Future Life of Antarctica. And uh, as I mentioned a little bit, Antarctica kind of kept coming up again and again in the in this book as I was researching it. And uh, it is a book about Antarctica that is not about polar explorers, penguins, whales, seals, or um, or climate doom. Um, it's it's much it, it's much bigger in a lot of ways. It deals with aspects of uh, life and evolutionary history and the and what we can expect from the future um, that uh, that don't get talked about so often because these other subjects tend to pull everyone in. Um, I have an, a long article that I hope is going to come out within the next couple of months that will be an excerpt from the book about the incredible, diverse, vibrant, lush life of the seafloor in Antarctica, which contains all kinds of organisms that you may have never heard of or, or thought about. So uh, one of our participants wants to know um, a little bit about how your work with caracaras um, or birds in general influences your music. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's it's difficult to to answer this question um, because to me it's it's all sort of part of the same thing in the sense that um, you know the best scientists I've ever met are very imaginative people and. Um, and enjoy just sort of collecting odd bits of information and synthesizing them and almost kind of can't help themselves. Uh, and, you know, art and science are ways we have of understanding and interpreting the world around us. So I wouldn't say there's anything so linear as like, well, because I like these birds, then I, now I write songs about birds. I mean, the birds turn up in my songs every once in a while, but I don't have a lot of songs about birds. Um, but they're just all part and parcel of the same kind of, um, piecemeal curiosity that's that's driven me ever since I was a, a kid and it, it doesn't escape me that that you know you have these birds that seem to be kind of interested in everything or the the thing that really grabbed me uh -huh. so one might ask uh, how you balance these two aspects of your career <laughs> <laughs> with great difficulty I'm never bored but I'm I'm, I'm always tired <laughs> but it's a good tired right um it's working uh, yeah um, yeah, one of our participants uh, said, um, it seems like caracaras have become more numerous in central Texas in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, do you know how far north in Texas do they regularly occur? All the way. I mean, they're, they turn up in Kansas. Uh, they turn up in the Dakotas. Uh, they're, they're more numerous here, certainly. But I think with both the, um, uh, with the you know, when, when people stopped shooting birds of prey, which really is, we forget, is relatively recent in the U.S. I mean, people still shot birds of prey often up into the 60s um, legally. Uh, as somebody uh, said, that, you know, it's, uh, it's not habitat if you get shot in it. So even as number, the numbers of people have increased, um, the amount of habitat has, has also kind of increased in the sense that it's not as dangerous just to be there. Uh, so I think that might have, we might be sort of seeing a delayed reaction to that as well. Also, you know, humans have done such incredible, strange things to the landscape. You know, there, didn't, there weren't electric lights 200 years ago um, that wildlife is, has, has, you know, been pushed back by us. But it's also kind of, I think, now turning around and coming back in and learning how to live with us. And I, I think these birds are, are part of that, just like, you know, like the coyotes you see in Pease Park now or, um, uh, you know, raccoons, possums, like all of these animals are. Are, are figuring out what the what the deal is with us and how to how to make their living around yeah, us. And I, you know, I wonder if this sort of northward um, uh, movement of, uh, of birds is becoming something that we will see more of uh, in the U.S. Right now, we're seeing 
um, limpkins showing up, uh, you know, in, in places like Indiana, you know, so. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. They have apple snails there? Was, <laughs> I lived in Florida for a little bit, and I was really struck by that, that, you know, these introduced apple snails, these giant snails that are feeding on water hyacinths and things, and the limpkins just love them, and so do the snail kites. It's like, well, I mean, on the one hand, well, you'd rather not have all these introduced species. On the other hand, um, some of the, the the animals that live there just see it as an opportunity and learn to make use of it. That's right. Well, it appears they're uh, finding substitutes. Um, we've had a summer long uh, limpkin uh, in uh, Barton Creek this year. So oh, that'd be are, amazing. Many yeah, wait, there was had one? an opportunity to see that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> I love that. <clears throat> You know, the the uh, the uh, one thing that I learned, you know, from researching this book was that I hadn't really realized what a separate world South America was from North America, um, because they were isolated from one another for 120 million years. And for 30 million years after South America separated finally from Antarctica, um, it didn't connect with North America. That didn't happen until between three and five million years ago. And it was an entire world of animals that was different. From the one in the continent to the north and when they connected there was this great you know they called the great american biotic interchange where if you've ever been to the the um, texas memorial museum and seen the glyptodont shells they have down there and, and ground sloths and like these are animals that came north from south america and we have um uh, more north uh, large mammals from north america ended up thriving in the south than than happened in the opposite direction ultimately but um we, we do still have three South American uh, animals, you know, that walked here from there uh, commonly. And they are um, uh, armadillos, and nine-banded armadillos, um, porcupines, and uh, opossums. Because marsupials are actually from South America. Um, the ancestor, common ancestor of all the Australian marsupials or, um, is, seems to have come from South America through Antarctica. Wow. And... So if you ever wondered why we had one marsupial, it's because it's uh, wandered up from South America. Interesting. Uh, so we've got two more questions, uh, unless uh, anybody else uh, pops something into the chat. Um, so um, the first of them is, uh, what makes the caracara more clever than ravens and other birds get, uh, that are commonly given credit for being smart? Well, I, you know, I don't know about more clever. Like we haven't had a head to head, you know, we haven't given them the SAT, <laughs> but it's, uh, I do love seeing that actually here in the hill country. You can actually see ravens, crested caracaras, and black vultures all near each other. And it's like these are like three models of the same animal that are all that, you know, seem to have all kind of come together. Uh, one thing I talk about in the book is that, you know, if striated caracaras are so clever, what are they doing only in the Falklands? Why haven't they conquered the rest of the world? And part of the reason I think is just an accident of geography. If you're a raven, you have, I mean, most of the land in the world is in the Northern Hemisphere. And as the glaciers retreated, you know, ravens had this immense sort of kingdom that they inhabited in the in the northern part of the world. Um, whereas striated caracaras are, are stuck; they have nowhere to go. They go east or west; they just hit ocean, and all the brains in the world can't get them out of that predicament. So, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not certain about how they would, you know, I would love to see people do some comparative experiments with like Ikeas and, and striated caracaras and ravens and seeing what different, you know, tasks they uh, seem to especially like to do or um, uh, enjoy or, 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 or do, do best at. But nonetheless, it is interesting that these different, you know, from these different lineages, um, they produce these, these animals that seem to be very similar and not just to each other, but also to us in the way that we approach the world which is what makes us think things are intelligent, right? That like the standard of intelligence is always this thing, <laughs> rightly or wrongly. Very true. Oh, <clears throat> last question. And yeah. it, um, it's uh, our most important question of the night. Did you hold the bird eater spider? <laughs> <laughs> uh -uh. I was, uh, I was perfect. I did take that picture. So I was within, you know, a foot of it, but, um, but that was, as close as I wanted to get, I, I, when I met Sean and uh, Sean was, I mean, he just, I can't say enough good things about that man. He, uh, I called him up um, when I read about his research and just reached him at a, the the lab where he was finishing his PhD in Canada and said, you know, would you like, could, could I just take you to Guyana? You know, so you wouldn't have to do any research. You could just take pictures and talk to me on this trip. And he was like, sure, you know, we'd never met. So we didn't meet until we met in Georgetown. And he was just as game as could be. He just was 
and, and the best subject you could imagine in the sense that he would talk to you for hours and hours about anything. Uh, so I have all these recordings of him and, and uh, it was just, he was marvelous. But the first night in Georgetown, before we left for the South, um, he was talking about all the dangerous things in the forest. And I admitted to him that I was afraid of spiders. And he said, oh, I'll teach you to love them. And uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say that he got quite that far. I mean, I really, I, I appreciate spiders. They're very interesting to me, but I definitely felt less afraid of them at the end of that trip. Um, maybe it was exposure therapy. But with the bird eater itself, you know, they're so big that they don't even, my mind didn't, I felt like didn't even register it as a spider exactly. It, it was just like some other kind of, of creature. And um, then that scene in the book, you know, Sean walks away with the thing still on his head to go put it back where it was. And Brian, uh, who had, who had uh, found it, uh, I, I turned to him and said, I, you know, Sean, he's just not like, I, I've never met anyone quite like him. And Brian said, in the, Brian had this fascinating voice that was a little bit sort of Yoda-like. And he said, I don't think scientists are like most people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> any scientists uh, want to uh, comment on that one? <clears throat> All right, well, that is um, all that we have in the chat. I think uh, some of us could probably ask questions of you all night long, but uh, we want to be respectful of your time and realize that oh, thank it's, you guys uh, so much for having me. Super late where you are. Well, no, actually, I'm in Dripping Springs. It's no later are than you? it is oh. for you. Yeah, um, but I do live in Germany uh, normally. Um, so and I have done talks where it's three and four in the morning when I'm finishing up and I'm, you know, the, the, uh, the Travis Audubon Society supported me um, with a small grant years and years ago when I was working on my master's degree about striated caracaras at UT. And um, I remember coming and giving a little talk about it, you know, back in 2005, I think I had a slide projector. Um, so it's uh, it's wonderful to be back, but you guys have been with me for um, a, a hefty hunk of this journey and I so appreciate it. We really thank you for your time and expertise tonight. And I know if folks haven't read the book yet, I hope this will inspire them to read it and we'll be excited to see. Book's a wild ride. I mean, I wrote it for Antarctica people who- book. We're excited about that one. You have to come back and talk to us about that. Put lots of bird stuff in it so that <laughs> we can talk about it. No. We'll no more again. birds. Okay. No, no, there'll, there'll, there'll be birds. birds. There'll be birds in it, but they're all dead, you know. Actually, that's not right. true. There's, sure there's a lot of birds yeah. in Antarctica. Yeah, we thank you so much. And thanks everybody for being with us tonight. And we hope to see you in person in October, October 20th. So- Good night, everybody. For trivia. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. Thank you so much. Travel. You guys have a good night. Thank you. Good night. good night, everybody. Oh, too late. Yeah.